today. We have an excellent question from Ayan, who is 23 years old and lives in Barakpur, West Bengal. He writes, Even though I have great respect for Advaita Vedanta, I have no respect for any ritual, scriptural commandments, casteism, or the ideologies of politically motivated religious groups. I don't perform puja, prayers, or mantra japa, and frankly speaking, I have no faith in mythological deities, avatars, saviors, or prophets of any religion. I don't believe that the words of God are revealed in scriptures like the Bhagavad Gita, Vedas, Puranas, Bible, and Quran. So my question is, can I, as a non-believer and as a lover of reason, practice Advaita Vedanta and gain moksha in this life without accepting all those beliefs. Wow, Ayan is quite articulate in expressing a huge issue that many spiritual seekers face. We live at a time when religious and spiritual traditions based mostly on faith or belief are rapidly losing their relevance. In modern times, faith and belief have largely been superseded by reason. Today, all ideas, whether they're ancient or modern, are subject to being rationally evaluated. Ideas that are found to be reasonable are accepted, whereas ideas that contradict reason are likely to be rejected. Unreasonable ideas get rejected regardless of the source, whether it's a best-selling book, a holy scripture, a respected religious or spiritual leader, or a video found on the internet like this one. Western scholars say that the age of reason began about 400 years ago, when educated Europeans started to rebel against the dogmatism of the Roman Catholic Church. Up until that time, the Church had been considered the final, unquestionable authority in all matters, both religious and worldly. For example, the Church taught that the sun orbits the earth, and this idea was accepted by all as a matter of faith. Of course, that idea was disproved by Copernicus and Galileo using newly developed methods of astronomical observation and mathematical reasoning. In spite of that, the church actually refused to change its teaching. In India, on the other hand, such a conflict between faith and reason never seems to have arisen. Faith and reason managed to coexist more harmoniously in India than in the West. Why? Well, unlike Christianity, the Hindu religion never rejected reason. In fact, reasoning was not only accepted as being compatible with religion, but religious teachers themselves actually employed reason to clarify matters of faith. For example, the Vedas prescribe many complicated rituals that involve elaborate offerings and special mantras. Sanskrit commentaries on the Vedas make extensive use of reasoning to explain all the details of those rituals. An even better example is found in the non-dual teachings of Advaita Vedanta, teachings that come from the Upanishads, which are part of the Vedas. Those scriptural teachings are rigorously supported by reason 
and by personal experience. For this reason, Advaita Vedanta is said to be based on scripture, reasoning, and experience, on shruti, yukti, and anubhava. This threefold foundation was embraced by every teacher of Advaita Vedanta, including the greatest of them, Adi Shankara. More than 1,200 years ago, Shankara himself wrote, if thousands of scriptural statements were to declare that fire is cold, I would reject them all. Compare Shankara's words to a glaring counterexample of Martin Luther, a famous Christian theologian. He said, reason is Satan's greatest harlot. Luther knew that reasoning could threaten his reformed version of Christianity, a version that was based exclusively on faith. Faith alone, as he said. Now, we can turn to Ian's question. He calls himself a lover of reason. Based on our discussion so far, being rational isn't an obstacle at all. Ayan was born into a Hindu culture that respects the role of reason. Yet, not all Hindus consider reason to be important in religious and spiritual life. Some seem to be inclined to merely accept or believe whatever they're told without really understanding anything. Some pious Hindus stress the importance of blind faith, andha vishwasa. Unfortunately, blind faith can actually be an obstacle for students of Advaita Vedanta. Vedantic teachings must be fully understood. One who simply believes those teachings to be true might not make the effort to properly understand them. It seems to me that critical thinking and healthy skepticism can really be quite helpful in spiritual life. Ayan went on to say, I don't perform puja, prayers, or mantra japa. And frankly speaking, I have no faith in mythological deities, avatars, saviors, or prophets of any religion. Okay, but is any of that truly an obstacle for students of Advaita Vedanta? To answer this question, we have to consider an important but often overlooked teaching of Hinduism. The principle of Adhikari Bheda, a principle that acknowledges the great diversity among religious and spiritual aspirants and prescribes different teachings for different people. Let me explain. Most religions have a fixed set of doctrines and practices that are mandatory for all followers. No allowances or adjustments are made for individuals based on their personal dispositions. So, regardless of your goals in life, your intellectual qualities, and your degree of emotional maturity, you have to follow specific approved doctrines and practices whether they happen to suit you or not. For some people, that creates a big problem. Like, if they buy an item of clothing that's advertised as one-size-fits-all, but it doesn't happen to fit their distinctive physiques. One-size-fits-all is just promotion. It's not a statement of fact. The same is the case for any religious or spiritual tradition that claims its teachings are suitable for everyone. 
An obvious example of this one-size-fits-all mentality is the fact that all Christians worship Jesus and all Muslims worship Allah, whereas Hindus are free to worship Shiva, Vishnu, Krishna, Durga, or any other form of God according to their personal preferences. Hindus can choose an Ishta Devata, a favorite form of God, in keeping with the principle of Adhikari Beda that recognizes and accommodates the diversity of worshipers. So, Hinduism prescribes different doctrines and practices for different kinds of people. For example, for those who want to go to heaven, the Vedas prescribe elaborate rituals that can produce the punya, or religious merit, needed to reach heavenly realms. Those rituals are found in the first section of the Vedas, known as the Karma Kanda. For those who are not inclined to perform such rituals, the Vedas prescribe special meditation practices, which are found in the second section of the Vedas, the Upasana Kanda. And for those who seek moksha, liberation, freedom from suffering, the Vedas prescribe a profound method of self-inquiry and spiritual growth that's found in the final section of the Vedas the Jnana Kanda, also known as the Upanishads. Each of the Vedas' three sections are meant to serve the religious and spiritual needs of different kinds of people. Ayan said that he wanted to gain moksha, so there's no problem at all if he chooses to ignore the rituals and meditations found in the first two sections of the Vedas, and instead he chooses to focus exclusively on the spiritual teachings found in the Upanishads and other related scriptures. Ayan also said that he has no faith in mythological deities, forms of God like Shiva and Vishnu, nor does he believe in avatars, incarnations of God like Rama and Krishna. But as we saw before, based on the principle of Ishta Devata, Mayan can pray to God in any form, or he can pray to God without any particular form. He can pray to a formless form, so to speak. In Advaita Vedanta, Ishvara is the name for God without form. Ishvara is the all-powerful, supreme, intelligent being who is the ultimate source of all that exists. Ishvara is the uncaused cause. Ishvara is also responsible for the intelligent order of the universe, the laws of nature that make planets orbit their suns and make our hearts go on beating. Ishvara's intelligent order includes the laws of karma. For this reason, Ishvara is understood as the karma pala data, the giver of the fruits of our deeds. Ishvara ensures that our dharmic actions lead to desirable results and our adharmic actions lead to undesirable results. So, even if Ayan rejects all forms of God, he can still pray to Ishvara, the formless God who makes his heart continue to beat and who gives him the fruits of his deeds. To simply understand or appreciate Ishvara in this way is itself a kind of prayer. After all, prayer connects us to a reality or power that's infinitely greater than we are. 
whether that power resides in a form like Shiva or Krishna, or if that power belongs to Ishvara. Ayan also said, I don't believe that the words of God are revealed in scriptures like the Bhagavad Gita, Vedas, Puranas, Bible, or Quran. As we discussed before, a lack of belief in mythological deities and so on is not a problem. But what about a lack of belief in the divine origin of the Vedas, especially the Upanishads, the ultimate source of Vedanta's non-dual teachings? Well, the Vedas are indeed considered to be eternal and divinely inspired. They're said to be revealed by Lord Brahma himself at the beginning of each cycle of creation. That's why the Vedas are sometimes called the breath of God. But even if Ayan doesn't accept the divine origin of the Vedas, it remains a fact that the Vedas contain extraordinary teachings revealed by the rishis, the sages of ancient India. The rishis are known as Kranta Darshis, those who can see beyond, those who were endowed with the capacity to discover truths that lie beyond the grasp of others. Whether the Vedas were revealed by Lord Brahma or by the ancient rishis is a matter of great importance for religious scholars. But is it equally important for spiritual seekers? For followers of Advaita Vedanta, the true value of any scripture depends entirely on its contents, on its capacity to lead you towards moksha. That capacity doesn't depend on the origin, age, or authorship of a scripture. We know from the testimony of so many saints and sages that the teachings found in the Upanishads are powerful and effective, regardless of where they came from. The same is true for the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. Many people believe that the Gita is a historical record of the actual words spoken by Sri Krishna himself on a battlefield just before a terrible war broke out. But that cannot possibly be true. Why? Because Sri Krishna and Arjuna spoke in a conversational language not in elegant Sanskrit verses composed in a poetic meter having exactly 16 syllables per line and a specified pattern of short and long syllables. As you probably know, the 700 verses of the Bhagavad Gita are an excerpt taken from the great epic Mahabharata. And the authorship of the Mahabharata is attributed to the great Rishi Vyasa. Presumably, Vyasa composed the verses of the Bhagavad Gita based on the actual conversation between Sri Krishna and Arjuna. So, the Gita really contains the words of Vyasa, not Krishna. But suppose Ayan thinks that the famous dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna never truly happened, and instead it's part of a fictional story composed by Rishi Vyasa or someone else. Even then, the amazing, powerful teachings found in the Bhagavad Gita remain unaffected. What difference does it really make if they're the teachings of Krishna, or of Vyasa, or of some other unknown enlightened person? Ayan concludes with a heartfelt question and asks, Can I, 
as a non-believer and as a lover of reason, practice Advaita Vedanta and gain moksha in this life without accepting all those beliefs. Based on everything we've discussed, the answer, of course, is an emphatic yes. Moksha doesn't depend on any kind of belief or faith because moksha is a matter of knowledge. Adi Shankara said quite boldly, jnanam eva moksha. Moksha is gained through knowledge alone. By knowledge, he meant the personal discovery of your true inner nature, atma, which is pure consciousness, unborn, uncreated, limitless, vast, and utterly untouched by suffering. Shankara's bold statement is based on the fact that your true nature is already divine, already limitless, already free from suffering. The problem, then, is simply ignorance, your inability to recognize your true divine nature, atma. That inner reality remains unrecognized when it's covered or hidden by the so-called veil of ignorance. Fortunately, the teachings of the Upanishads, of the Bhagavad Gita, and of great teachers like Shankara can remove that ignorance and lead you to fully realize your true divine nature. That realization is moksha, liberation, enlightenment. If you'd like to submit a question for a future video like this one, please email it to me at the address shown at the end. Be sure to write video question in the subject line. Also, please join us on Sundays at 11 a.m. Eastern Time for a live stream of our weekly question and answer sessions. 